Hello, my name is Bill Thomas, and as the Surgical Skills Tutor of the Royal College of Surgeons of England, I'd like to welcome you to this Intercollegiate Basic Surgical Skills course. As you will know, this is a mandatory requirement for all basic surgical trainees and candidates for the MRCS examination. The programme and materials have been approved by all the four surgical royal colleges, and the course itself consists of three modules, open surgery, trauma and orthopaedics, and minimal access surgery. Each module consists of exercises that have been chosen to demonstrate safe and sound surgical techniques. However, we would wish to stress that the course in no way seeks to impose or promote these techniques as being the only safe and sound way of performing these surgical procedures. Rather, we are seeking to teach one safe way that trainees may utilise as it's very much easier to learn good habits early on in your career than trying to unlearn bad habits later on, which is a very difficult and painful procedure. Each exercise will be demonstrated by a short segment of video, after which you will have plenty of time to practice the exercise under the tutorship and instruction of your course convener and faculty. Throughout the course, you will be assessed as to how well you are grasping the principles demonstrated, and the aim of this assessment is to give you constructive feedback that we trust you will find helpful. We hope you enjoy the course, and we trust that it will provide you with safe and sound techniques that you will find valuable for the rest of your career. The operating theatre is a potentially hazardous environment and the surgeon has responsibility not just for the safe conduct of the operation itself but for the safety of both the patient and staff in the theatre. Last but not least is the surgeon's responsibility for his or her own personal safety within the operating room. There are many hazards within an operating theatre environment but surgeons should be especially aware of those from sharp instruments, electrosurgery, ionizing radiation and blood-borne infections. Electrosurgery will be dealt with in a separate part of the basic surgical skills course and will not be considered further here. Although ionizing radiation is largely the responsibility of the attending radiology staff, surgeons should be aware of the potential hazardous effects ensuring that they take avoiding action and wear appropriate lead-lined clothing where there is a risk of exposure. The surgeon should also be aware of the general principles of infection control. These include hand washing, the use of protective clothing, the management of waste generated during procedures and the cleaning, disinfection and sterilization of instruments and materials. These principles apply in the operating theatre as they do in all areas of surgery. We're all well aware that hand washing is important, but it is particularly important between each patient contact at ward level and in the operating theatre. Hand hygiene is something which most doctors take for granted and is thus not given the attention that it merits. This slide shows the areas of the average hand which are typically missed during a hand washing procedure. It is particularly important during a surgical scrub that attention is paid in detail to these areas. To protect the surgeon from infection, it has been suggested that we should consider every patient an infection risk and embrace the concept of universal precautions. This means that the blood and body fluids of all patients should be considered infectious and appropriate precautions taken. This is a departure from the traditional practice of considering only certain individuals to be high risk and a move towards a new practice where we identify high risk situations in which the likelihood of contamination is high. This is particularly relevant in terms of transmission of blood-borne viruses to healthcare workers and the commonest methods of transmission are shown on this slide. The risk assessment of patient encounters is shown here. In the operating room there is likely to be contact with body fluids in most procedures 
and a high risk of splashing in any kind of open surgery. Personal protection is provided in all operating theatre environments and should be worn by staff as appropriate to the risk of exposure. It should be noted that it is the personal responsibility of the individual to use the equipment provided. Failure to do so would prejudice against an individual in the light of any dispute. Notwithstanding the use of protective equipment, it is very important that surgeons and nursing personnel, particularly those at the operating table, take special care with the handling of sharps. Great attention should be exercised in the transfer of sharp instruments from one individual to another, and no two individuals should handle the same sharp instrument at the same time. This transfer is most easily achieved by placing the sharp instrument into a bowl or kidney dish for handover. Where a sharps injury occurs, and this will occur from time to time even in the best regulated of environments, it's important to be aware of the appropriate action that should be taken. The injury needs to be assessed as to the depth of penetration, whether the sharp instrument was clean or contaminated with blood, and in particular whether a hollow needle was involved in the injury. In this situation it is important to assess the patient risk level. For example, is the patient a known intravenous drug user or known to carry a bloodborne virus? The injured area should be allowed to bleed freely and should not be scrubbed as this may encourage deeper penetration of the contaminant into the tissues the injury should be reported to the Occupational Health Service and the injured party should undergo blood testing following appropriate counselling. If there is particular anxiety, the original patient may be considered for blood testing but only after appropriate counselling and consent is obtained. In summary, the operating room is a potentially dangerous environment with all the individuals within it exposed to risk. Simple precautions can minimise the risk to each individual and prevent cross-infection or injury to patients and staff. Surgeons should remember the importance of hand washing and adopt the routine use of universal precautions. Proper sharps handling should prevent injury, but in the event of an incident, surgeons should be aware of the proper course of action. The risk to all personnel in the operating theatre should never be underestimated. After adequately washing your hands, take one of the towels and dry one hand and then fold gently and sweep down to the elbow. Discard the towel. Take the other towel and repeat the procedure on the other hand, once again sweeping down towards the elbow and then discarding the towel. Pick up the gown and open it out so that the inside faces you. Insert both arms into the sleeves and allow the assistant to do up the back of the gown. It's wise to keep the hands inside the cuffs of the gown sleeves at this time as we're going to perform a closed gloving technique. Once the gown is done up, your assistant will hand you the glove pack, which should be opened on a sterile surface. Take the gloves and use a closed gloving technique, inserting the fingers into the glove as appropriate and then pulling back on the cuffs. Repeat the exercise with the other hand, again inserting the fingers into the glove and pulling back on the cuff until both hands are satisfactorily gloved with no excess glove at the fingertips. Then hand the tab holding the posterior string of the gown to your assistant. Turn around and then tie both strings at the side with a bow. During this course you will be handling animal material, 
Therefore, it is essential to wear well-fitting gloves and aprons at all times. In the operating theatre, ensure that the gloves are pulled up over the cuffs. To maintain your fingers' sensitivity, ensure that there is no excess glove material at the tips of the fingers. When opening a suture package, tear it open as shown and remove the needle from the packet with the needle holder. Never use your fingers. Never pick up needles with your hands. It is important not to handle sharps directly like this. When picking up needles, use the needle holder. And then, if you wish to alter the position of the needle in the needle holder, don't use your fingers. Use the forceps to hold the needle and reposition it. Also, be careful when tightening sutures that the needle does not do damage outside your field of vision. Therefore, when dealing with a long thread, don't simply pull at the needle but use the middle finger of your right hand to grasp the thread and then use your closed forceps to take up further slack. Suture material can then be tightened without the needle leaving your field of vision. Your suture material is then passed to your assistant and the needle is now available for your next suture. When you have finished with the needle, do not lay it down on the patient or on the table but pick it up and, whenever possible, dispose of it by cutting off the thread and placing it in the sharps bin provided. Never handle a blade with your fingers, but always use a hemostat as seen here. Slide the blade gently onto the handle. When it comes to removing it, just lift it off from the distal end and slide it off gently without jerking. Immediately place it in the sharps bin that is provided. Remember when operating, do not have the table set too high or for your back's sake too low. The most comfortable position to operate in is one where your forearm is resting horizontally. When handling all instruments, safety and economy of movement is essential. Relaxed handling is needed in order to avoid awkward movements. Safe and effective surgery requires correct and safe handling of all surgical instruments and sutures. Please take time to acquaint yourself with the instruments provided. Let's first of all look at the scalpel. When handling the scalpel, you do not handle it like this or like this, as you don't intend to stab anyone. Instead, handle it in this manner, using your index finger to steady it. Then you can draw it gently and carefully across the skin, as you see here, in a controlled manner. Never, ever cut towards your own fingers or thumb, as it may not just be the patient that you cut. When doing delicate work with a fine bladed scalpel, you may wish to hold it like a pen. Then finer work can be undertaken. Note how the little finger can be used to steady the hand holding the scalpel. When passing a scalpel, never pass it blade first, but handle first with the blade down. However, the safest way is always to put it into a kidney dish and pass it to your assistant or scrub nurse. Now, let's look at the scissors. There are two types of scissors. One is more robust for cutting suture materials and the other is finer for tissue dissection. Let's look at how to hold scissors. Hold them with just the tips of the distal phalanges with thumb and ring finger in the rings, steadying the scissors with the index finger and the middle finger. Never put your fingers right the way through, as this makes it difficult to extract your fingers from the instrument. 
However, by using just the distal phalanges, you get very good control for accurate dissection. If you're cutting sutures at depth, such as in the pelvis, it's often wise to stabilize the instrument over your index finger. This allows for accurate cutting and prevents a tremor down a deep dark hole. We now move on to the forceps. There are two basic types of forceps. One is the non-toothed, the other the toothed. If we take the toothed forceps, such as we see here, these are often used for tough tissues such as skin. While the non-toothed forceps tend to be used for more delicate tissues such as bowel. Hold the forceps as you see demonstrated here and not grasped in your fist like this. By holding them gently, you get accurate control of the tips of the forceps. Now, let us consider the hemostat. Correct handling of the hemostat is critical. Pick it up much as we did with the scissors, using the distal phalanges. And, as one is opening them, put pressure on the thumb against the ring finger and middle finger and then the hemostat opens gently in a controlled manner. If holding it in your non-dominant hand, you might wish to hold it in this manner, and then put pressure from the middle and ring finger against the thumb and index finger, and open the hemostat in a controlled manner. Watch again pressure from the middle and ring finger against the thumb and the index finger and it opens smoothly. Do not let the hemostat jerk as this can do damage to any blood vessel it might be holding. Finally, we come to the needle holder. As mentioned previously, always pick up the needle with the forceps, then pick up the needle holder in a similar manner to the scissors and the hemostat. Place the needle holder about two-thirds of the way around the circumference of the needle, as you see here. Do not place it too near to the tip or the rear of the needle, and place it in the jaws of the needle holder, as demonstrated. Insertion of sutures requires a smooth supination of the forearm, but occasionally a backhand suture is required, in which case the needle position can be changed in the needle holder enabling you to insert a backhand suture. This is an exercise of forearm manipulation with one arm pronating and the other supinating synchronously. Watch again, one arm is pronating while the other arm supinates and therefore the needle can be changed from the forehand to the backhand very simply and efficiently. Using the jig provided, practice tying a standard two-handed reef knot as seen here. At the end of the procedure, you can see the classic picture of a reef knot as clearly shown by the different color threads. We will now tie one in slow motion demonstrating once again the features of tying a two-handed reef knot. Ensure that the threads end up at the opposite side of the jig to which they started and snug down the throw securely. Then repeat the throw coming back again ensuring that the threads end up at the opposite side of the jig to which they started to ensure that the knot lies correctly. Once again, the classic picture of a reef knot is seen.
take the short end of the suture in the hand that you'll be using for tying. And if it is away from you, we use the index finger knot. This is tied as shown here, taking it under the other length of the suture. Then go back, use the middle finger knot, and then snug down. And once again, we see the classic reef knot picture. We will now tie one in slow motion. Take the shorter end and tie the index finger knot as seen here, bringing the black suture under the white one and then securing and snugging down by pulling the black end towards you. It is essential in a reef knot that your hands cross with each knot and that alternately an index finger knot and a middle finger knot is tied. Here is the middle finger knot being tied, and this time the black end of the suture is taken away from you as you tie it down. The same principles apply when tying a reef knot with instruments. Take the instrument and with one throw over it, grasp the shorter end of the suture and gently pull it through and snug the throw down. Then do an opposite turn, again grasping the end of the short suture, pull it through and you see the classic picture of a reef knot emerging. Let's now demonstrate some common faults in knot tying. A satisfactory reef knot requires alternating throws of index finger and middle finger knots, crossing the hands with each throw. For example, if we do an index finger knot, but don't cross our hands, we will not have the correct throw for a reef knot. Alternatively, we could do the correct throw one time, but then tie the same type of knot, the index finger knot, and although we cross our hands, still not have a reef knot. Here, we see an index finger knot being correctly laid, and a middle finger knot being correctly made, but the hands not crossing. And again, we don't end up with a reef knot. Let's therefore remind ourselves of the correct way. Index finger knot. Crossing the hands. Middle finger knot. Crossing the hands again. And here we see the reef knot. One other common fault is for the surgeon to hold one end of the suture up and tie round it. And although they may appear to tie alternate knots and cross their hands, they are actually tying round the suture. And you can see the white thread runs straight through the knot, resulting in what is virtually a slip knot, and the white thread can be withdrawn. This is therefore not a secure knot. Always remember to cross your hands, as you see here. For added security, two reef knots may be tied on top of each other. Occasionally we want a knot which is secure and will not slip even with one throw. Therefore we can tie two throws as seen here and snug that down and then return by two more throws. And although we don't have a very pretty looking knot, we have a very secure surgeon's knot. Let's tie this now once more in slow motion. Take the threads and cast the first throw of the reef knot, and then take the thread through once more. Then you're in a position to snug down that first throw of a surgeon's knot. And as you do so, ensure that it lies correctly. Tighten that first throw appropriately. As you can see, 
it doesn't look very pretty with this thickness of thread. However, repeat the same procedure. One throw, as for the reef knot, and then take the thread through a second time. And once again, snug down the second throw. And although it looks somewhat cumbersome with threads of this size, it's a very secure knot. This knot should be used with very great care. It involves tying two throws of the same type of knot and then snugging it down until the correct tension has been achieved. And then, for security, tie a classic reef knot on top of it. This should only be used in a controlled situation where the surgeon needs to utilize a slip knot. Once again, in slow motion, you see two of the same throws being cast using the index finger and snugging that down. And then a similar throw using the index finger again. Once these two throws have been cast, Push them down into position using the index finger, tightening to the correct tension. A reef knot should be tied afterwards for security. It is absolutely essential that a formal reef knot is tied, otherwise the slip knot will slip and become insecure. Let's look at a model for tying a depth in the pelvis. You see here a simulation of a small blood vessel deep in the pelvis, cunningly made from a straw and a blob of blue tack. Take your suture material in the tip of a hemostat and pass it round the blood vessel, taking great care not to exert any tension. Bring the suture material out of the pelvis, tie and snug that down using the index finger. Again, exert no tension on the vessel itself, but tie against counter pressure from the index finger. Then tie a further throw outside the body, snugging it down with the index finger and tightening it by counter traction against the finger. Do a third throw for security and snug it down. Once complete, one is in a position to cut the suture. Ensure that no tension is actually placed on the vessel itself at any time. You will be provided on your jig with a small glass pot which has a screw in the base of it. Use the same technique as has been demonstrated to tie at depth within this pot. Take your suture and bowstring it in the end of a hemostat and place it around the hook. Withdraw out into the open and you're in a position to tie your first throw. Snug it down, taking the index finger beyond the vessel and tighten it without putting any pressure on the screw itself. Do a second throw and snug it down again, being careful not to exert any pressure on the screw. You may then want to do a third throw for security, again snugging it down, and then you can cut the suture material as appropriate. Suturing is a surgical practice which has been in use for thousands of years and is still an essential part of the majority of today's surgical procedures. Although commonplace, it is essential that there is some understanding of the role of sutures in wound healing the difference between suture materials and their relative performance characteristics. 
incised tissues must be held in apposition until the healing process has endowed the wound with sufficient strength to withstand stress without mechanical support. The appropriate use of sutures reduces the amount of connective tissue needed to repair the wound in the normal healing process, minimizes the size of the resultant scar, and accelerates the healing process itself. We can define a suture as a strand of material used to approximate or to ligate tissues. Since Lord Moynihan's definition of the ideal suture in 1912, it has been accepted that his criteria represented an impossible dream. However, advances in suture material technology over the years and in more recent times, new developments in absorbable suture technology are bringing the concept of the ideal suture ever closer. Because the ideal all-purpose suture still does not exist, the surgeon must select a suture that is at least as close to the ideal as possible and provides the suture qualities shown in the chart. Sutures are now available which can be matched to the healing process of individual tissues and the requirements of specific procedures, allowing the surgeon to choose the suture best suited to achieve the aim of uneventful wound healing. We can categorize the many types of suture materials available by reviewing the three major characteristics of any suture material. These are whether the material is absorbable or non-absorbable, constructed as a monofilament or a multifilament material, made from a natural or a synthetic source. The main advantage of an absorbable material is that no foreign body is left permanently in the patient to give rise to long-term problems. An absorbable suture must retain its strength long enough to provide wound support until the healing tissue is capable of surviving without that extra support. Therefore, its absorption must be predictable. Non-absorbable sutures are materials which are not broken down by the body, thus remaining in place permanently. Some non-absorbables can actually be broken down gradually, losing tensile strength. For example, nylon absorbs water over time and is weakened by this process, but the mass of the material is not absorbed or destroyed by the body. Silk is broken down by the body over a period of years, but is still considered to be non-absorbable. The disadvantage of non-absorbable sutures is that a foreign body is left in the patient, which can lead to long-term rejection problems. Sutures are also classified according to their structure. Monofilament sutures are made of a single strand of material. Because of their simplified structure, they encounter less resistance as they pass through tissue than multifilament suture material. They also resist harboring organisms which may cause suture line infection. These characteristics make monofilament sutures particularly well suited to vascular surgery. However, because of their construction, extreme care must be taken when handling or tying these sutures. Crushing or crimping can nick or create a weak spot in the strand. This could result in suture breakage. Multifilament sutures consist of several filaments or strands, twisted or braided together. This affords greater tensile strength, pliability and flexibility. Multifilament sutures may also be coated to help them pass relatively smoothly through tissue, enhance handling characteristics and minimize the risks associated with bacterial growth within the strand. Coated multifilament sutures are well suited to intestinal procedures. Synthetic absorbable suture materials which closely resemble naturally occurring body substances can be produced chemically. These can be absorbed without the tissue reactions often associated with natural fibres. The advantage of synthetic absorbable sutures is that they have very predictable strength retention and absorption profiles. 
In addition, they tend to be very strong materials, which virtually eliminate the risk of adverse reactions. Synthetic non-absorbable sutures are relatively inert, and when implanted, induce only a minimal response by the body. This results in encapsulation of the material without adverse reactions. Occasionally, encapsulation may result in the suture being extruded or expelled by the body, especially if the supposedly non-absorbable material has started to fragment. Natural materials are those derived from naturally occurring sources, such as animal or plant tissues. Since the withdrawal of catgut and linen in many countries, natural sutures are now only available as non-absorbables in most of Europe. The most common form of natural material is now silk. The advantage of natural sutures is that they tend to be easier to handle and not. The disadvantage is that they elicit a vigorous tissue reaction. It is not the intention to discuss wound healing in detail in this course. However, when choosing suture material, consideration should be given to those factors affecting wound healing time and the matching of suture materials to patients and the tissues being sutured. Whilst the stages of the wound healing process, from lag phase to proliferation, are common to most tissues, it should be remembered that individual tissues heal at different rates. It can be seen that some heal quickly, like bladder and bowel. Others are much slower, especially fascia, which has only regained 70% of its original strength after one year. Skin is slow healing, but it is thought that the high elastin content allows the early removal of sutures without wound breakdown. The diagram shows the variation in wound repair time for some commonly incised tissues. The rate of tissue healing, combined with the factors which affect wound healing, must influence the choice of suture material. Just as there are many factors to be considered in relation to the healing wound, there are many factors in the performance of absorbable sutures and their resulting contribution to successful wound healing. There are two aspects to consider, actual suture strength and how long is strength maintained. Suture strength is usually determined by its not tensile strength, which is measured by the force which the suture strand can withstand at the point of knotting. The tensile strength of the tissue to be mended, i.e. its ability to withstand stress, should determine the size and tensile strength of the suturing material that the surgeon selects. The accepted rule is that the tensile strength of the suture need never exceed the tensile strength of the tissue. The second aspect to consider is how long this strength is actually maintained. It can be seen from the chart that just as tissues heal at different rates, suture materials retain strength and absorb at different rates. Therefore, the surgeon must now choose the most appropriate material for the tissues being sutured. Synthetic absorbable sutures are hydrolyzed, a process by which water gradually penetrates the suture filaments, causing the breakdown of the suture's polymer chain. This process means that the loss of tensile strength and the rate of absorption are separate phenomena, which are clearly demonstrated by the figures in the chart. A suture can have lost all its tensile strength and the tissue have healed, but potential adverse reactions are still possible until all the material has completely disappeared. It is therefore important to be aware of the time taken for the suture mass to be absorbed. As with any implanted foreign body, a suture material may elicit biological responses during the first post-operative week. While most materials will cause a mild reaction, synthetic materials tend to be less reactive than natural fibres. The chromic catgut sample shows extensive tissue reaction 
with an acute inflammatory response, but this is no longer in use. Contrast this with the minimal tissue reaction that occurs with polyglycaparone, which is a replacement for chromic catgut. Surgical eyeless needles are manufactured in a wide range of types, shapes, lengths and thicknesses. The choice of needle to be used must rest with the surgeon and may take into account several factors, such as the requirements of the specific procedure, the nature of the tissue to be sutured, the accessibility of the operative area and the preferred techniques of each individual surgeon. The choice of needle shape is frequently governed by the accessibility of the tissue to be sutured and normally the more confined the operative site, the greater the curvature required. The point profile of round bodied needles is engineered to provide easy penetration of tissues. A flattened area is provided halfway between the point and the suture attachment. Positioning the needle holder in this area confers extra stability on the needle being held. The blunt taper point needle has been designed to minimize the risk of needle stick injury. The needle point is sharp enough to penetrate fascia and muscle but not skin. This virtually eliminates accidental glove puncture. The taper cut needle combines the initial penetration of a cutting needle with the minimal trauma of a round bodied needle. The cutting tip is limited to the point of the needle which then tapers out to merge smoothly into a round cross section. The conventional cutting needle has a triangular cross section with the apex of the triangle on the inside of the needle curvature. The effective cutting edges are restricted to the front section of the needle and merge into a triangulated body which continues for half its length. The body of the reverse cutting needle is also triangular in cross section, but has the apical cutting edge on the outside of the needle curvature. This improves the strength of the needle and particularly increases its resistance to bending. The final decision on the choice of the most suitable suture material and needle combination rests on the careful consideration of a number of essential factors. The operation access and the type of tissue being approximated will determine the needle choice and the size of suture gauge to be selected. The tissues and their wound healing requirements will determine the choice of suture for any particular operative procedure. Other patient related factors that may result in potential wound healing complications will further influence the choice of suture material. Begin by making an incision in the simulated skin pad provided. We will now close this with interrupted sutures. Take a suture in your needle holder and insert the needle at right angles to the incision using counter pressure from the forceps. Pull the suture through gently without snagging it. Secure a standard reef knot, either using the one-handed technique or the instrument technique. Cut the suture to such a length as will allow it to be grasped for subsequent removal. As a rule of thumb, the distance from the edge of the wound should correspond to the thickness of the tissues being sutured. Each successive suture should be placed twice this distance apart, approximately double the depth of the tissue being sutured. Continue to insert your sutures in this manner across the entire wound. Now, let's insert another suture. When the incision edges are as closely aligned as these, it is appropriate to go through both edges with one smooth movement. But as will be demonstrated later, this is not always possible, and often the edges need to be taken separately. Once again, tie a reef knot. When inserting sutures, adopt a 1-2-3 technique. 1, 2, 3. Once again, tie your knot 
making sure that it lies correctly without any tension. Once the wound is closed, ensure that none of the knots lie over the suture line. There may be two types of wound you will be required to close. One, a linear wound, as you see here, the other, an elliptical wound. If you have to make an elliptical wound, try and ensure that the length of the ellipse is at least three times its width. When closing a linear wound, it may be easier to start in the middle of the wound, as you see here, inserting an interrupted suture and then ligating it. Remember, with these simulated pads, the tissue is often very springy, more so than normal skin. Make allowance for this during your exercises. Once the initial suture has been placed, it is then easy to halve the remainder of the incision each side to continue to close it. Therefore, insert one suture halfway along the remainder of one end of the incision and ligate this. Then, having completed that suture, again halve the remaining wound and continue as shown. It may not be possible to do this for an elliptical incision, and you may need to undermine the incision edges to increase mobility of the skin edge. In this situation, it is not practical to start in the middle of the wound as such a suture will be under too much tension and therefore inaccurate. Thus, in this situation, start at the end of the incision, inserting a suture at right angles and getting right down into the depths of the incision, and then come back at the other edge of the skin, again at right angles to the skin edge, and ligate that particular suture. You can then proceed to the other end of the incision and, in a similar manner, insert the suture at right angles into the depth of the wound and then out again at right angles onto the other edge of the incision and tie a standard reef knot. You are now in a position to continue to close this ellipse, working from each end alternately, inserting interrupted sutures like this. This makes for a most satisfactory closure. We are now going to close the same incision using a continuous suture technique. Insert the first suture as before at right angles to the skin edge and ligate this using a standard reef knot. However, in this situation, just cut the short end and hand the long end of the suture to your assistant, who will follow you during this procedure. The second suture is put in in a standard manner as before, and then the suture snugged down and handed to your assistant. Here comes the third suture, the distance apart being exactly the same as for interrupted sutures. Work along the wound, each time ensuring the same tension, and then hand it to your assistant who maintains that tension. Work along the wound, ensuring equal distance between the sutures to ensure the same tension down the whole length of the incision. After the final suture has been inserted, leave one loop long and then ligate using a standard reef knot technique. Once this has been tied, 
you're in a position to cut both ends of the suture material. We will now demonstrate the essential role of the assistant in the insertion of a continuous suture. Start once again by inserting the initial suture and ligating this using the reef knot technique. In this situation, let us assume that we wish to maintain a hold of the end of the short suture as a stay. In this case, get your assistant to place a hemostat on the end of the suture, grasping it right at the tip of the jaws, not up near the hinge where it would slip. Grasp it in the tip of the jaws and place to one side. Then pass the other length of the suture to your assistant and make sure that they hold it the right distance from the wound. Not too close and not too far away. Then continue suturing. As you insert the suture and pull it through gently, your assistant should release the suture and allow you to snug it down. Pass it again to the assistant. As one continues along the incision, it is important that the suture material does not get caught around instruments, as you see here and your assistant should remain alert to such a danger. Unfortunately, in this case, the assistant was not alert and allowed the suture material to twist around an instrument. It now becomes increasingly difficult to untwist this and panic sets in. The assistant then starts to put their hand into the middle of the surgeon's view, which is even worse, but eventually the suture material is freed. Pass it again to your assistant who will be wary for the rest of the operation. When cutting sutures, do not cut them too long as this long length of thread will be a needless waste of suture material and will get caught up in the wound or in the dressings. However, don't cut them too short, otherwise this will be insecure and might even lead to the unravelling of the knot. Cut the suture to such a length that it will be secure and also allow the suture to be grasped during its subsequent removal. Mattress sutures can be inserted to allow for eversion or inversion. They can also be used for irregular skin edges. We will demonstrate here a vertical mattress suture. The suture is put in, as you see, in the standard manner. The needle is reversed and then, taking just a small bite of the skin edges, the suture is completed and a reef knot tied. A second vertical mattress suture is inserted. The suture is placed. The needle then reversed in the needle holder and then go back taking just a few millimeters of skin edges. The knot is then tied and the suture material cut. Let's insert just one more vertical mattress suture in at right angles. Reverse the needle and then going back. Just taking the wound edges as seen. We will now demonstrate the horizontal mattress suture. 
the initial suture is as before. Again, reverse the needle in the needle holder, but on this occasion, move slightly horizontally and go back to the other side of the incision in a similar manner. One can see very clearly why this is called a horizontal mattress suture. Once again, the reef knot is tied in the standard manner and the suture material cut. We will now insert another horizontal mattress suture. The suture is inserted in the standard manner. The needle reversed and then returned to the opposite side of the wound parallel to the initial traverse. The suture is then secured with a reef knot. Both vertical and horizontal mattress sutures can be useful for ensuring eversion or inversion of wound edges, and this is clearly demonstrated by diagrams in your handbook. The difference between the vertical mattress suture and the horizontal mattress suture can easily be seen in this demonstration. Start the subcuticular suture by inserting a knot at the far end of the incision. Tie a standard reef knot and then cut the short end of the suture very short as we're going to bury the knot. Then, using the forceps, carefully retract the skin edge. Take a small bite of the subcuticular material and pull the suture through. Then, on the opposite side of the wound, insert a similar subcuticular bite of the suture material and gently work up the wound, ensuring that each bite does not go too deep into the tissues. Each new suture must be inserted almost opposite the exit of the previous suture, and this ensures that as the suture material is tightened, it draws the wound edges together, almost in the manner of invisible mending. The accuracy of the placement of the sutures will ensure an equal tension down the wound and neatness of the closure. You can see here a needle going in just at the skin edge, taking a bite of the subcuticular tissues and coming out at the skin edge. At the end of the incision, the needle can be exited about a centimetre away from the edge, and then the needle reversed and passed back almost through the same hole in the skin in the opposite direction. This can be repeated, passing the needle through the same skin hole, back again and then cut. For non-absorbable sutures, some surgeons like to use the collar and cuff technique. There is a crushed bead at one end, followed by a larger bead to stop the suture being pulled through the needle hole. Once the closure has been completed, a further bead and cuff are placed onto the suture end, and once the correct tension has been applied to the suture material, the metal bead is crushed using a substantial hemostat or bead crusher. And then the suture is cut. We are now going to excise a lesion from under the skin. In your pad, you will have a simulated lesion deep under the skin that you can feel rather than see. 
make an elliptical incision over the lesion, all tied twice in continuity. Once a second reef knot has been satisfactorily tied and the ends of the suture material placed in the hemostat, then the vessel can be divided between the two knots. The suture material cut and there we have a ligated and divided vessel. The other method of hemostasis to be demonstrated is more suitable for pedicle ligation. Here we see a leash of vessels, again in the small bowel mesentery. We are going to divide this leash using a different technique. In this situation, the peritoneum is divided through both leaves of the small bowel mesentery, either side of the leash of vessels. The entire pedicle is then picked up and placed in the hemostat which is laid down gently, and a second hemostat is placed as demonstrated here. The pedicle can then be divided with scissors and a suture placed round each of the hemostats and tied, again using a reef knot. When the first tie is snugged down, instructions are given to the assistant to release the hemostat gently and then the knot can be completed. The suture material can then be cut immediately. A similar tie is placed around the other hemostat and once again instructions given to the assistant to release the hemostat once the first throw is satisfactorily tightened down. Two more throws can be placed, laid properly, and then the suture material cut. This technique is suitable for pedicles throughout the body. If your specimen contains significant lymph nodes, and if time allows it, Practice your dissection skills by removing one of the lymph nodes as demonstrated in the following section of video. A lymph node biopsy is often required in different situations and using the small bowel provided, a lymph node in the mesentery will be dissected out to demonstrate some of the principles. Firstly, the peritoneum over the lymph node is divided, taking care not to damage the lymph node itself. Throughout this dissection, take care to handle the lymph node itself as little as possible, so that there is minimal crushing. Gentle dissection, using the scissors as you see here, is used to expose the lymph node, which can then be lifted up very gently by holding a bit of the adventitia that covers it. If you do have to lift the lymph node, try and pick up the adventitia as seen here, rather than crush the entire node. As dissection proceeds, one should look very carefully for any feeding vessels. Often, these may need to be ligated or diathermied in real operative circumstances. Care must be taken not to damage the vessels in the base of the mesentery underneath the node, which is then dissected out in its entirety. The final dissection is performed, revealing the undamaged vessels in the base of the incision. And then the last vessel or leash may need to be ligated or diathermied before the actual node is removed and sent for histological examination. There are several essentials for any bowel anastomosis. There should be no tension. There should be a good blood supply to both ends of the bowel. There should be accurate apposition of the bowel ends 
with an immaculate and accurate suturing technique. We are now going to demonstrate an end-to-end -end anastomosis that might follow resection of a lesion.